Hello and welcome back to Shattered Lives. This is our annual, well it was, <laughs> our weekly edition of The Week in Crime where we discuss all of the crime stories that we've worked on and some of the, the, the stories that are in the news that we're interested in speaking to you about. Um, I'll introduce Michael O'Toole, crime correspondent with the Irish City Star first. Hello Paul Healy, chief reporter with the Irish City Star, how are you? <laughs> I'm not too bad. Um, yeah, I suppose we should explain where we've been. Um, very grateful to, I suppose, receive a lot of messages from people both of us have um, asking, where the fuck have you gone? Um, so, look, the honest truth is we were bollocksed. Uh, very tired. And uh, we also went on holidays, the two of us at different times. Yeah, not together. Not together. <laughs> took, took, I think, well-deserved breaks all around. Um, and look, People are entitled to take breaks. Um, like we we have uh, difficult jobs at times outside of this as well. Like we I wish we could, uh, you know, give everything to this podcast, and we want to give everything to this podcast. But sometimes the honest truth is that we can't um, always. And it's, but we so we decided we come back when we're ready to come back. So. And and people have to realize as well, and people probably don't know this. This 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 podcast it's. You know, it's a labour of love, but it's also something we do outside our normal working hours. So you and I are covering murders and, you know, all the all the daily news that, that we have. And we do this because we want to do it. But, it, you know, it's significant work outside of what we do. But it's it is, as I say, it is a labour of love. So I think we're both very refreshed now after our, our, our well, it was a week for me in the sun. How long were you away for? Uh, well, I was nearly away for the whole month of June <laughs> on and off because, uh, uh, yeah, I, I, two different. I was I was on holidays, um, um, and also then went to Glastonbury, which I'm gloating about a bit. But uh, yeah, I was very lucky to go to that. So yeah, it was a busy month. So I I went to I, I was telling a copper made a man in this, and he laughed at the irony. I went to Lake Garda in it, northern Italy, and he thought, where he said, where else would a crime correspondent go? So he did, and it's it's a fair point. But uh, you know, I was I was an Italian speaker before I became a journalist. So my degree, and you may know, I studied Italian school. I lived there for a year. I, I did it at so university. You didn't, you didn't just pick it out because you saw Garda over the. I'll go there. Well, that, that was obviously true. I took a few pictures right. and sent them a few coppers. And no, but look, it, it, Lake Guard is a fantastic spot. Very expensive, uh, apart from certain places. But look, I, I had a great time. And I, I don't know about you, Paul, but I certainly feel much more refreshed because, you know, you do you do get very jaded. It is a tough gig. It is, you know, it's not a nine to five job. And we have to fit, as I said, the pot in, in between doing everything we have. And, you know, some days we're up to high row because we're literally... You more than me, although I'm trying to get out more. We're running around all over the country. I mean, I was, I mean, very sadly, I had to drop everything on Tuesday to go down to Port Leash. And that was, you know, I was there for seven hours all in and nobody saw that coming. And we're, we're going to talk about that later on. It was the, the sad death of two, uh, father and son in Turkey, but they were from Port Leash. So in our job, things happen. So it's very hard for us to have structure because we need to have structure to do this part of the certain. And sometimes you just can't. And sometimes work gets in the way. It does. Yeah. And we want to give this 110 percent. Uh, we want to enjoy doing it, too. Um, so, you know, uh, we're going to aim to be as regular as we can about it. Um, but that, that's the honest truth is that we want to be able to give it 100 percent. And when we couldn't, we had to take that break. So but I will say before we move on, I actually did miss it. It's a, it's a, Aww. I know I did. Did I, you miss I, me? Uh, you're breaking up there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, but I will say it's, it's given, I don't know about you, Paul, but it's given me a whole new sort of lift in journalism because it's a different sort of journalism that we do. And I particularly like what we're going to try and do some of the, the, the long form interviews. It's a, my, I mean, I feel as a journalist, my interview technique has improved because I, I do the interviews. So, you know, it's very good and it's very enjoyable and we'll do them while we can. Absolutely. So, when we get to our first topic of the day, um, Jonathan Dowdall. Yeah, we're still speaking about Jonathan Dowdall. Um, that is because uh, he learned the result of his appeal there last Friday, um, and I was lucky enough to be sitting there in front of him again. Um, so, yeah, it was a fascinating day. Uh, long and short of it is, he lost his appeal. Um, um, I don't think that anybody anticipated any other results, but I think something that did surprise me um, was the, it was quite a short judgment. I, I, I thought that 
the judges pretty much threw out every one of his arguments quite swiftly and quite quickly. Uh, there was no basis for any of the arguments he was making as to why his sentence, uh, as he said, was unduly lenient. So his, his sentence was four years. Uh, that's four years for facilitating the murder of David Byrne. And he was arguing uh, that that was uh, too severe. Sorry, that that was too severe. Um, and that uh, there should have been some mitigation uh, that, that that the sentence could have been cut a little bit. Uh, he argued that his father, for example, the exact same offence, his father got two years in prison, his dad's now free already, um, and was trying to argue, well, what's the difference between what he did and what I did? Why did I get the more severe sentence? And the judges just threw all of that out um, and stated that, you know, his involvement in this affair was not as innocent as he tried to portray it, that he was kind of duped by the Hutch gang uh, into booking this room for Kevin Murray, flat cap, uh, that he was used as a pawn to effectively help their narrative uh, that perhaps the Regency was carried out by someone other than themselves. Um all of that was rejected. The judges said there was plenty of evidence there that Jonathan Dowdell was involved before and after the murder uh, in driving Jerry Hutch up north, the recorded conversation, all of that. Um, so, yeah, it was just well and truly thrown out. Yeah, so I was away for this, but that that was one thing that did jump out. Obviously, he, he lost the appeal, but the judge, was it Mr Justice Birmingham, was it? Yes, Mr Justice George Birmingham uh, was the presiding Okay, so what struck me, I thought that was a very strong line when the judge says he was involved before and he was involved after. So that jumped out at me when I was when I was reading it on my on my holly bobs. Yeah, and, and I think that was the nail in the coffin, really, because that's the, the you know Jonathan Dowdle has been trying to argue um, that that he was an innocent pawn in this game. Uh, but look, he was charged with murder, and he he, he only accepted that uh, lesser charge at the last minute. Um, we kind of know the reasons what behind that now to a degree uh he was facing a murder charge a much more serious charge um so look i think he i think he's very lucky and, and justice birmingham stated that when this appeal was first opened in june i mean we already got an indication of how uh the judges felt about it because um Miss, mr justice birmingham said at that stage that he felt that 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 uh, Dowdell had already been quite lucky and in the end in summing up his judgment there on Friday he said you know if anything the sentence was un- was was too lenient um and he's lucky that he didn't get longer he could have given him a lengthier sentence that was well within his power but he didn't didn't do that said he was satisfied with the four year sentence and dismissed the appeal um what i thought was just as an observation somebody actually called me out on this because i, I tweeted that Jonathan Dowdell was looking a little grayer uh, and someone said, Gee, how could he look any greyer than he did three months ago? You know, but to me, to my eye, and now it's been some time since I've seen him, but to my eye, he did look greyer, uh, a little more gaunt, a little more serious in the face. Um, you know, I, I I think he looked in poor form, I would say. Uh, didn't really react to, I think he knew uh, that he wasn't going to win his appeal, so barely reacted. But again, flanked by prison officers and Gardaí, uh, the, the the armed support unit were outside the CCJ again. So that's indicative of he continues to be a major security concern for Gardaí. And then he was swiftly brought back to Limerick Prison. So I think what's interesting and just worth speaking about uh, in relation to that is where do we stand now with Dowdall? What's next for Jonathan Dowdall? Because a lot of people are wondering, you know, uh, he had an application for the Witness Protection Programme. So has he been accepted or not? Has his family been accepted or not? And to be honest, there's no clear answer on this because I've seen it reported that uh, he was accepted into the programme. Um, but I, I don't understand that to be the case. Um, and I think if that was the case, he wouldn't be in prison right now. Uh, because I got very strong indications there in the last couple of days that in the event that Dowdall is admitted to the witness protection program, he will be removed from prison. And, and it'll be extraordinary because even even though he's serving a four year sentence, uh, there is a plan in place. The Irish Prison Service uh, and the Gardaí, they are aware of this. There is a plan in place uh, to grant him what's called temporary release from prison in the event uh, that the guards want to remove him, i.e. in the event that he is accepted into this programme. So temporary release, you, you want to explain that, Mick, because it's 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 not really as it says on the tin, necessarily. No, so TR, from my experience, is usually given to prisoners who have a few months left 
on their sentence and you're given TR. Um, so it's not quite the revolving door, but say if you've got you've got a six year you're doing a six year stretch and you, you've got five years done. You know, it could be a year. It could, have I heard of a year? It's definitely months. It's not five years. You know what I mean? So it's given a, a, a lot of people would get it. They're out on TR, but I, I just find that very interesting. And just to go back, it's a four-year sentence, but as we know, he will serve twenty-five or seventy-five percent of that, so three years, and that's backdated to when he went into custody, which was when he pleaded guilty to the facilitating charge. So that was before the trial. So he's and and you and you you know it, it's backdated then. So he's probably got. Probably two and a bit years. Yeah, two and a, two and a bit years. So what what is really interesting is what happens next. I told you that I was speaking to one senior fellow who, at the time, and people are entitled to change their mind. He he thought that he wouldn't get it. I think he probably thinks that he will get it. I think he he will get it just even for a duty of care to him and his family. But there it, it wasn't guaranteed, and I just find it really interesting. So the first indication we'll get is when he disappears from Limerick Prison. Yeah, well, but as you just said there, the TR is usually not towards the end of somebody's sentence. But what's unique about this circumstance is uh, I'm being told that it could happen at any moment because he's such a security risk. And I guess once he's accepted into this program, he can't really be on the witness protection program and still be in prison. You're not really being protected then. Um, you haven't been moved on to the whatever location they've they they might decide for him. So I'm being told he can get it at any time. I'm going to just paraphrase something that a source has said to me today, actually on this, and um, that that TR can technically be given at any time. Prison service will weigh up issues surrounding his detention and will liaise with the guardy unit relating to the witness protection. Um, once the the so-called minimum requirement is met relating to his sentence. Uh, he can be granted full TR. There'll be restrictions laid out for him and he can be moved at short notice. Um, and he will technically be under the care of the prison service for six months. Uh, uh, that just seems to be the way the system works normally, although there's nothing normal about this. Um, so, you know, he's going to be moved out of the prison late at night or early in the morning. That that That's how it'll happen. We'll all learn about it long after the fact. And I'm going to ask a question. I'm not asking you. I'm sort of asking myself. I wonder if you're in TR, are you allowed to leave the country? I, I, I don't think you are. But again, this is this is unique. So will this mean, as my source is telling me there, uh, at least for a six month period anyway? he'll have to be in the country so he might be residing in an address somewhere in this country under the protection of the guards perhaps and then moved on we don't know the answer to that but what i think is very interesting about this is that once the guards make that decision they can take him they could be taking him right now for all we know um but in the meantime he sits in a cell on a landing that ha- that can occupy up to about 12 people a dozen prisoners but they can't put a single other prisoner on that landing while he's there uh, such is the threat. I'm sure that the the prison service, because there is a real accommodation crisis within the prison service at the minute. You know they have to do their job, and whatever prisoner is there, but they'd be more than happy to have those twelve, eleven other spaces freed up. Absolutely, and you know they were talking about moving them the last couple of months here, there, everywhere. And Arbor Hill Prison even was mentioned, um, but in the end, I think they've realised that it was too much hassle to to do anything with them, so they've just left things as they are. But yeah, ideally. They need him out of there. So I wonder what the delay is. That's just what interests me. Maybe the appeal delayed things. We might hear things in the coming days now uh, in terms of his witness protection um, application. Has he been accepted or not? So it'll be, we'll, we'll watch that space. And I, th- I think it's pretty safe to say we'll only hear about it after it's happened. So I don't think anybody will be advertising yeah, this. And then are we restricted in what we can say? You know, because once you are in witness protection... You know, you can't really be talking about that person anymore. It's a criminal offence for us mm-hmm. to disclose where they are, mm-hmm. and it's yeah. and, and I, I, I think we can name people. Obviously, it's known because we people talk about Charlie Bowden and Russell Warren and that sort of stuff. But it is a criminal offence for us, and they're very, very tight about this. You know, there's also a criminal offence to name members of CAB. Apart from certain officers, by law you're not allowed to. I know that slipped a bit because I often see reports, but by law you're not allowed to name cab officers apart from the the, the senior heads. So yeah, I, I I wonder about that basically. But once it it'll be like subjudice really. Once he's gone, he's gone. We won't be able to say anything about where he is, or else we'll be in Limerick prison. <laughs> 
I, I, I think, you know, I think he's got off lightly in this. He'll have to spend the rest of his life looking over his shoulder. But, I mean, he's known that now for some time. Uh, but I, I think, as uh, as has already been said, he, he, he'll, he'll be able to re- rebuild his life. I, I think it's extraordinary that he launched an appeal. I suppose everybody launches an appeal. But four years, he could have been, do- he could have been doing life, could easily have been doing life. And just a reminder to people, every year in the annual report of the prison service, they reveal how long the average life sentence is. And it has been increasing. Years ago, it was seven years. I mean, like in the 90s. But my last reckoning, lifers in Ireland on average now serve 20 years. Now, maybe maybe 21.2, something like But you know what I mean? It's a hefty sentence. So four years, which is three with uh, three with remission compared to 20 that's a big difference. I, I There's no guarantee. Uh, I wasn't going to bring this up, but you're just making me think of a case there from the other week where we, we interviewed a fellow who'd just been released after 43 years. So, you know, you could be in there for two decades or for for four decades, um, you know, depending upon your behavior and how you engage and all of that. So there's no guarantee under a life sentence that you get out of 20 years. It could be in 40 years. No, I wonder if the rules have changed, but I remember being told before, if you admit your guilt, if you're a murderer and you admit you did it, you know, that goes towards the parole board and it and it, it's still the minister has to decide. But if you're sitting there, you know, like whoever and saying, I did not do this and you're found guilty by a jury and you're banged up, it does not bode well for you for getting out after a certain time. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I'm, look, I mean, it, it's it's the system I think is only really catching up now because as, as the, the average time now is 19 20 years uh and that that's a good thing because previously you could get out after 15 years but shall we move on i I actually started with the wrong topic we were supposed to talk about uh the development or uh, i i suppose uh, it's a development of sorts in the irene white case so we obviously did a pod uh one of our last pods before we took a break on the irene white case um and off the back of that then um it had been reported in the Irish Independent uh, there last week that um, that there was uh, a file with the DPP recommending that a person be charged with the murder of Irene White. Uh, I, I can see you looking at me, so hold on. <laughs> to point out that, look, uh, in, in journalism and in newspapers, uh, people report things and other people then report similar things. Um, to be fair to Mick, and you did say it on the pod, uh, you, you it has already been reported by yourself, Mick, and, sta- and stated on the pod that a file is with the DPP. Um, if it in fairness to Robin Schiller's report, it says that that file recommends that person be charged with murder, uh, and that that's their that's their uh, development in that story. And I'm going to explain how the files work. Um, and we'll talk about, I'll give you an example of Larry Murphy. So the way it works is there's a district officer who's a superintendent, you know, say for Store Street is the DMR North Central. That's the district officer there. Then there's Pierce Street, which is DMR South Central, all that sort of stuff. So so the, the way it works is there's an investigative file. There's a bookman or a bookwoman who writes, the, puts the file together and at the end, there'll be that will be forwarded to the law officer, to the DPP for consideration on who's going to be charged, if any. But the superintendent, when he's when he or she is doing the file, the superintendent will nine times out of ten, there have been some cases when they haven't made a recommendation, but they will say, having examined all the evidence in this file, our recommendation is to you that X should be charged with Y. You know, so it's there. This is what we think. This is what we could think we could sustain. But it's up to DPP. So the DPP might say, well, you know what? Uh, you know, just speaking generally, I don't want that person charged with assault causing harm. I want them charged or her charged with assault causing serious harm. So it's up to them. The law officer decides. But there is a recommendation from the people who've investigated. So we know in this case there is a recommendation. And the recommendation is that a certain person be charged with murder. Now, we know now Power and Anthony Lamb. Anthony Lamb was the man who carried out the murder of Irene White in 2005 in Dundalk and County Louth at her house at Ice House, Ice House Hill. Gruesome murder. Stabbed her repeatedly uh, as she was at the, at the sink. Really, really violent crime. And uh, Irene's mother, an hour and a half later, had you know had the shock of finding her body. So it was a real scandalous crime. And then Nal Power, who was a former business partner of Alan White, Irene's husband, widower, subsequently uh, I'd met, went into the Dock Garda station after we did a story saying the guards were going after the other person following Lamb's own uh, guilty plea and sentencing to life. 
So Nal Parr pleaded guilty to murder as well. So it's now about the third person. Now, there was a major development last week when you knocked on Alan White's door in Dundalk, just outside Dundalk and County Loud, and I think in Knock Bridge. And what did he have to say for himself? Because this is really important. Well, yeah, look, we did this because of the report in the Irish Independent uh, that, that this person, the guards are recommending this person be charged with murder. Um, so again, a bit of a pressure pulse has been has been placed on this case again. And everybody kind of knows, the dogs in the street knows, anyone that's uh, familiar with this story, and Alan White knows that that person is himself, that it is, uh, that, that is the person that Gardaí uh, have recommended to the DPP be charged in relation to the murder of Irene White. Uh, that is her husband. So I, I felt, um, and in fairness, it's not the first time he has been doorstepped, uh, but it's it's maybe the first time that that question has been put to him about the fact that the guards want to charge him. And it, it's it's up to Mr. White as to whether he wants to comment or not. But it's, it's the fact that he did speak to me and did speak to me as openly as he did. Uh, that we can now state quite freely, you know, on this podcast, uh, and indeed as we reported last week, that 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 he is the person that uh, that the guards have sent the file to the DPP in relation to. So just just to go back, as you say, he does speak freely. I remember when Anthony Lamb was jailed for murder, I doorstepped him coming out of the CCJ, the Central Criminal Court mm. in the CCJ complex in Central Dublin. And we walk along and he was chatting freely and he was talking about how shocked he was that there would have been, you know, because the court heard that there were people who were involved in the commissioning of the murder and that sort of thing. And he said he hoped that whoever was behind it was was caught. But you spoke to him. So I'd be interested in what the flavor of what he was saying. Yeah, well, you know, in, in fairness, you, you never know how a doorstep is going to go uh, until the person opens the door. And, and you can tell then by their de- demeanor whether they're going to speak to you. I kind of knew within about 10 seconds that he, was, he wasn't going to slam the door in my face. He seemed quite amenable and approachable and um, spoke to me at length. And the, look, I said to him, look, there's a report in the Irish Independent today uh, saying that the so-called mastermind uh, in the murder of your wife is to be charged or said that the guards wish uh, to charge him with murder and they have sent a file to the TPP recommending that. And uh, I said, look, I understand that to be you, sir, that the guards want to charge you. And his reaction to that was one of shock. Uh, He said that he was quite shocked with that. Uh, He said, everything's been so quiet for a while. This is so out of the blue. I wasn't even aware of it, to tell you the truth. This is the first I've heard of it, is what he said to me. Um, And I said, well, look, uh, uh, we verified the info because he he started asking me about the story and where is it? And I haven't seen it myself. And I showed him the story, but I said, look, we have also verified the information ourselves. Um, I, I, you know, have the guards spoken to you? He said the guards haven't. And he just continued to reiterate that he was shocked by this and stunned that the guards would want to charge him at all. Um, And he expressed interest in possibly reading uh, the report before saying much more. But look, you have to press somebody when they're talking to you. So I said, look, in the event that the guards uh, said the DPP comes back and says, uh, right, you can charge this this person and you're going to court. Will you defend your innocence in court? And he said, yes, of course. And I put it to him that, look, uh, you've read all the reports, I'm sure, over the years. Uh, that there is this so-called mastermind. Indeed, the two men, uh, w- one of the uh, men uh, who have been charged over this uh, mentioned a mastermind, the person who was paying him. And uh, I've said, look, that that person is supposed to be you. And he laughed at that. His reaction was one of, of he found that quite humorous. He laughed and he said, look, I, I'm, I'm no mastermind. I couldn't be the mastermind of anything. Uh, was his reaction. So look, he reiterated his innocence. He said that he's willing to defend himself in court if he is charged in relation to his wife's murder. And he he just went on to kind of say that he felt there were unanswered questions uh, in the murder of his wife. I said, well, what unanswered questions? Um, And he said that there were questions over uh, people's connections to drugs. And he then stated that that, uh, he has always been against drugs has always uh, has always expressed that he has a problem with drugs and has always been against drugs. So I uh, I think that that was expressing a, a certain sense of removing himself from maybe a particular narrative that's being stated about the murder. Anthony Lamb had addiction problems at the time of the murder, and he was and he was quite open about that, and he was and he was in a very very bad place about that. So. That might be what Mr. White is talking yeah, about. Yeah, sorry, the quote from him is, there was talk of drug involvement with some of those lads and I was always totally against drugs and still am. 
Um, there's there's unanswered questions, he said. Um, so yeah, I, it, we we didn't. It wasn't the type of interview. Like, because I did ask him, would could we sit down and do a proper interview? He said he'd have to consider that. So you know, a, a doorstep interview. This is what you get. But look, he said he's willing to defend himself. Um, he feels that he, he he told me that he is supported by friends and family in, in all of this. Um, and you know, he he basically feels that he doesn't really care what the public thinks. Uh, about him he he doesn't pay attention to that well I'll tell you there's two major unanswered questions for me will Nal Power and Anthony Lamb give give evidence against anyone who is charged in the future Um, you my understanding at the start when Power when when Lamb was done he did give an indication that he would but it's possible that things change when you're in prison and you know you might be unwilling to be seen you don't want to be seen in the prison population as a, a rat. Now, who knows? But uh, that might that might weigh in his mind. So we, look, we'll see. But if if those two men give evidence, that's very significant. And remember, they both pleaded guilty, so they admitted their guilt straight away and held their hands up when they were charged. So that's a big thing. Yeah, I'd I'd love to have, as I said, it was a doorstep interview. I'd love to have spoken to Mr. White in further detail about some of that. Um, Look, in fairness, he was amenable and and it did speak to me for ten minutes. But um, I, I I found it I found it very interesting to 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 see his demeanor and I suppose his his approach to the whole thing. Given the finger has been pointed at him in relation to the murder of his wife, um, he I I I would say that he didn't he he did he did express shock that the guards wanted to charge him but he wasn't exactly expressing shock in terms of maybe what the public perception might be about him or nor did he seem to care about that particular element of it um just thought that was interesting but just in relation to the time frame here it was last year we know that it was last year that the file was sent i think you know in the middle of last year really so it, it, probably a, a good year now that's a bit uh, uncommon for it to take this length of time. If you remember, remember the stories we did about a certain star was being investigated for rape, and he was arrested and everything. And we broke, we broke in that case that he'd been arrested. We broke in that case that a file had gone to DPP with a recommendation that he be charged, and then we broke that the DPP said no. I think that was about seven months between the file and the the decision by the DPP. So if it's over a year. Is that an indication that there's a problem? Yeah, I mean, it's taken some time, hasn't it? Um, unless, you know, you've mentioned those two individuals, you know, are they going to say anything? Um, maybe the guards are holding out or hoping for that, um, you know, to obviously bolster their case. Uh, I find it extraordinary that the finger has been pointed at this person now for, for some time. Uh, and it, it has, look, it, it will ultimately either be tested in a court of law or the DPP will come back and say no, and that'll be it. And remember, you know, the, the guards can ask or recommend recommend a charge. That doesn't mean the DPP will go with it. Perfect example is Larry Murphy. We know that, you know, the the, the, the guard he sent a file in relation to Dieter Jacob for him. They asked and recommended that he be charged with murder. The DPP examined it and the DPP said no. So the DPP is an independent office. They look, cold, she look and her staff look at the evidence coldly and then they decide. So... I'm not going to say it's up to the judges, but it's up to the DPP. Yeah, and and from one decision to the other now, we we should probably speak a little bit about RTE uh, in that the guards may have to make a decision as to whether they will even launch an investigation into all of the uh, goings on in RTE. Now, we're not going to do, uh, I don't think we're going to talk at length about everything that's happened in RTE because I'm sure everybody uh, has looked at that ad nauseum and, and knows more about it than probably even we do and we're not showbiz correspondents uh but purely from a crime point of view uh it's definitely interesting to talk about whether and a crime has allegedly or not been committed here um and both of us have been asking our sources and the guards directly uh whether there's anything here and and you think maybe there's no there there well, well so i spoke to a couple of lawyers and we have to trust that they know more about the law than I, than you or I do. And we have to trust what the guards, you know, say in the Economic Crime Bureau, who I know are sort of examining it. So 
the, the best way it was explained to me, look, I was speaking to one solicitor who was forthright and his view, as it stands, my this was maybe 10 days ago, there's nothing there. And the, the way he explained it to me was, the best analogy was there's a difference between, and this just, it's the best analogy I can give, it's not in relation to this, but say tax avoidance and tax evasion. One's a crime, one is quite legitimate. And he sort of said to me, as a parallel, he was looking at the, he was reading all the stuff and he'd be quite savvy about the media, put it that way, and he couldn't see any crime being committed. And then uh, a few weeks ago, in the middle of it, I, well, it was before I went away, so it was uh, before Rand Tuberty appeared at the, all those committees, I doorstepped the commissioner, Drew Harris, at the policing authority meeting in Drogheda in County Louth. And we asked him about this because there was a, it was a fury. I think it was, it was, I think it was the day that she and the rally, the chairperson said she believed that elements had been, what's the phrase, designed to deceive. So that was a big, that was, and I think it was, it was it Mr. Collins spoke about an attempt to, was it? Yeah, well, for, for, for me, uh, uh, prior to this, I think Mashi McGrath uh, had asked a question, um, in my view, without much basis as to, do you think the guards should investigate this? And he was kind of directing it at the, uh, at the entire board. Um, so up to that point, I was kind of, I didn't really think that there was any maybe serious argument for it. But uh, yeah, no, Richard Collins, who, who's now um, no longer the chief financial officer at RTE, uh, he, he was being questioned um, by Fine Gael's Alan Dillon um, and he was being asked about this this payment the, this this controversial uh, consultancy fees and he was asked specifically just about that that particular element of it and whether there had been potential fraud committed um, and, and, and he said look perhaps maybe the taxpayer uh, had in some way been maybe defrauded and uh, it was pointed out to him well if you think that there has been fraud committed here then maybe perhaps you should make a complaint to the guards about that because it's a criminal offence um, and he said something to the effect of he would take legal advice on whether he would do that to me that was the most serious thing stated in the public accounts committee of whether there was potentially because this is somebody who was actually the chief financial officer who was saying there's maybe there poss a possible uh possibility uh that that the taxpayer was defrauded in this um so maybe that would have to be on some level investigated by the guards just one one quick point i think mr collins is still the chief financial officer but he is no longer on the executive board my apologies. Yeah, he is not. No, well, just yes. Yeah. So, but he, but he is the current chief financial officer. No, just to just to make that. Yeah. So look, I. So it was after Miss Nirahali had made her comments, and that jumped out at me. That was one of the reasons why I went to draw her to go right. Let's see what the commissioner has to say about this. And you know the way you were talking about when you're doing a doorstep, you can know within ten seconds how it's going to go. You know. You know. Well, uh, when I asked, I asked the commissioner about is there going to be investigation is on the back of what Mr. Collins and Ms. Nirali have said. And he gave an answer and he said, look, we've looked at it. We, we, I'm, I'm going to paraphrase him. We've looked at it and we haven't seen anything yet. But that doesn't portray the look on his face. Now, it wasn't dismissive, but it was there was a, a, a relaxedness about it. As in, I think at that stage, he was happy that there was no, the, the, the guards would call it no offence had been disclosed. Now, we know that people like Paddy Cosgrave have subsequently made formal written complaints and they're being evaluated by the, the relevant Garda office, which is the Economic Crime Bureau. Uh, Detective Superintendent Mick Cryan, who spoke at a, 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 a another public, uh, Dahl com or Actus Committee, who was really interested about fraud. So it's his officers who will be evaluating this. But I have to say the vibes that I got just listening and looking at the commissioner at that stage, there was that they didn't think there was that much for them to investigate. Now look, it may change. There might be more coming up and you can never say never, but they were the vibes that I got. And we know before the commissioner spoke, I put a query into the press office saying, you know, they're effectively, now this is maybe a week before and there's nothing. And you put in another query afterwards, didn't you? Yeah. Um, this is no slight on the guard of press office. I understand that you have to put out particular statements um, when, but however it is, frustrating sometimes when you're asking very direct questions and you're not actually getting direct answers i quite simply just wanted to know which obviously there have been have gardy received complaints about rte 
and are they investigating them? And their, their continued line is any correspondence received by Angarda Shiakana will be examined to determine if a criminal investigation is warranted. I was like, well, okay, that's obvious. But look, we know probably, and this is probably what's quite difficult and frustrating for the guards is because this is such a national issue, they're probably getting hundreds, if not thousands of complaints, um, most of them being probably complete bullshit from you know anybody well there's so, a i remember being, being slightly lectured by somebody once about this there's a thing called locus standi or standee right so in other words it means that you have to have a position to make a complaint so you know somebody can't it has to affect them personally but i think it affects everybody make pers- a complaint yeah. you know well that's my point. You have to have locus standi, but I think everybody in Ireland has locus standi about RTE. You know what I mean? But, uh, but that's so what that makes is it difficult. A thing. Yeah, well, exactly. But look, but, uh, even if, if they someone, have, if someone like Richard Collins made a complaint, that would probably be taken more seriously. You know, given the statements that he's made in the in the pack. That's the interesting thing. When I put it to the commission, it was after Mr. Raleigh's comments and, and others. He said they'll have to come to us if they want to say something. Come to us, and then we'll evaluate it. So they definitely have Lucas Standy, but I think, and all the, the barristers in this can kick my head in, I think everybody has Lucas Standy in relation to RT in Ireland. Yep, that's true. Well, sorry, the, the last line that, that they have, the official Garda line, is that the Garda have not commenced any criminal investigation. But technically, they have been involved in an investigation. They're investigating whether they should launch an investigation, <laughs> which is in, in and of itself, they're trying to examine whether a criminal offence has been committed here. Yeah, but I, I don't envy them in that in that task, and especially with such a laser focus on this. Um, yeah, it's going to be difficult for, the, for them to come out and say there's there's no investigation here. I, I still think that they could potentially, I, I'm going to, just, just to be different, I'm going to say that I think they might have to just look into this, or at least say they're looking into it, uh, you know, but look. They may well have to, and and obviously they could get 6,000 complaints, but it's all about the same thing. So it's effectively one complaint. Uh, they, you know, they could get 6,000 complaints about this, right? But it's effectively one complaint. So it doesn't matter if you get one or 7,000, it doesn't really matter. It's one thing that has to be examined. So if you and I and everybody else in the star and the mirror and everywhere sends in a complaint, it doesn't really affect things for them because it's still the one, effectively the one issue. Fair point, fair point. We'll, we'll see where that goes. I think it'll be worth uh, maybe doing a pod in the coming days uh, where we might uh, get Sandra Mallon, our showbiz correspondent, on and, and speak about this in more detail because it's obviously continuing to roll over. But it's been a fascinating couple of weeks to be back in work, <laughs> for sure. I, I have to uh, say, I, I was I was on Lake Garda and it was, I, was, I plugged in the RT, my phone. We brought the wee gizmo to plug it into the TV. So I was sitting watching RT News when Ran Toberty was on, or, or RT News, whatever news now, when Ran was on outside and the sun was boiling. I, I gave up the sun to come in and watch it. It was it was brilliant watching, I have to say. It was really, really good. Yeah, it was better than any late, late show uh, that I've ever seen, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> not trying to be bad. Uh, Ryan's a lovely guy. I've 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 met him uh, personally. I think he he's he's a lovely guy. Um, um n- no uh, no slight to him personally, but I just wouldn't uh, necessarily be in the late late show audience. But you so I I I said this online. I've I've he's interviewed me a couple of times. I've been on his show a couple of times. Very very nice man. Personally, I think it's very hard for him to come back to RT. What do you think? Yeah, I, I mean, uh, even by the time this podcast is out, maybe it, things might have changed. I, 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 God, I don't see how you could go back um, after the comments that have been made. Um, I know he said that that's his job and he loves doing it and he wants to go back to it. But I think the relationship between RTE and Noel Kelly has been damaged. And certainly I've seen comments from the, the new director general, Kevin Backhurst, where he's indicated that he wouldn't really want to work with Noel Kelly. Um, I think that creates problems for Ryan Tuberty because obviously that's his agent. Um, uh, so yeah, I just don't really see a path back for him uh, to RTE personally. The big thing for me was when you know Emma, Emma Kelly, the RTE correspondent, who's also the union rep in the NUJ. I'm the union rep in the Star and Mirror, just to, for, for to be open. Um, uh, when she spoke very, very well at the protest and there were RT staff, remember she didn't, she didn't see the Midlands car. They were all at this big protest. And that was a big thing for me that RT staff were protesting about this inside RT. And I thought that was a bit, you know, that was a big hurdle for anybody to come back from. Huge. Yeah, I think it would be difficult to, 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 to uh, and, and to be clear, just my opinion on this, uh, um, it would be that, that 
there are bigger problems outside of Ryan Tuppity. Ryan Tuppity is not really the problem here. But yeah, for him personally, I just think it would be difficult for him to to come back into work uh, amidst that anger uh, that's there. I really feel for the the journalists in RTE. I mean, there's some fantastic journalists. You've mentioned some of them there in RTE and a great uh, organ, uh, news branch in RTE that's getting getting a lot of flack for all of this when really, and I've, we've heard talk of the two RTEs, uh, there's the more corporate side of things and, and the the so-called top talent. Uh, and then you've got the, the news and current affairs uh, element of it. And, and I think that they have been unfairly slighted in all of this. And then you've got people that are really on, on much lower salaries um, that, that potentially feel a little bit uh, awkward about this whole thing, about people on exorbitant, ridiculous, I mean, half a million a year salaries that cannot be justified. Um, and I, 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 I agree with that too, yeah, yeah. And I also think, look, everybody is entitled to get as much money as they can. You and I try and get as much money as we can. That's no problem. But, you know, you and I, I'm not going to name them, but there are some, there are a lot of fantastic hard-working journalists in RTE who put themselves on the line physically put themselves on the line I'm, I'm talking not even journalists but camera people that you and I would see at crime scenes all the time and their various things and I wonder how they feel you know when they see well here's my salary and here's all the, the salary of the talent but look everybody's entitled to seek as much money as they can but I, I, I can understand why there was a protest I'll put it that way yeah, and I, I think to be fair, I know Ryan Tuppity stated that he took a pay cut and, and he feels that he did. And, and the uh, the argument was this extra payment was coming from Renault and didn't believe or didn't know that it was coming from RTE. But I think on the facts of it, when you look at it taken together, um, there was no pay cut there. I mean, he was still getting paid over half a million a year. And, and I just think there's a lot of questions to be answered there in terms of D Forbes and the way that payment was handled. Um, it might not necessarily be Ryan Tuberty's fault in terms of like in terms no, of it's not. handled I mean, by his agent and uh, I do believe to a degree that he was a bit naive on his finances I imagine when you're on that kind of money um, that I wonder whether you even know how much money you have in your bank account um, you know <laughs> I, and, and you've raised something really really important and it had me shouting at the TV when I was watching this thing live. Why can our august politicians not pronounce Renault Renault properly? Why did every single one of them call it <laughs> Renault? That was driving it's me Renault. nuts. Are you sort of pronouncing it? Pro- exactly. And I was thinking, oh, Jesus Christ, it's a French word. We're one of our closest neighbours. Just fucking pronounce it properly, will you? We better get off this very controversial topic because we'll, we'll end up putting ourselves in trouble. Um, yeah, moving on. Can we, let's talk about let's talk about the Garda roster issue because I think this is it's a crime issue and it's very very important and a lot of our listeners are serving an ex Gardaí. So essentially, what has happened? This has been going on for quite some time. There used to be uh, pre there was a COVID roster which is was brought in obviously around COVID and that was to try and get more members out and about. And most guards I sp- I've spoken to I don't know about you Paul they're like it's four on four off. Now there were longer hours but you had four on now. The commissioner earlier this week issued a statement because there have been talks and it's, you know, it's been high stakes for quite a while, said, look, we're getting rid of the COVID roster, no longer fit for purpose and the various reasons. And we're going to have six and six on and four off. And significantly, they're going to go back to five units. Now, that is a massive issue because you know, there, there are under 14,000 Guardi at the minute. And even... With that number of guardy, there has been a significant increase in specialist units. So a lot of guards have been taken off what you and I or what the guards would call the regular, what they call in England and Britain response policing, so the frontline policing. A lot of them are going to economic crime, child protection, you know, SDU, security and intelligence, all the alphabet soup specialist units. So the belief of guardy is that this is a of, of rank and file guardy, guardy that you and I would speak to, she would say, that they believe this is a terrible move. They don't know how they're going to get go back to five units because they just don't think there's enough manpower or personnel to have five units. They can there are four units at the minute, A, B, C, D. Now go by A, B, C, D, E, and they just think it's a disaster. So what had happened is the minister, the commissioner has said, as it stands, in November we're going to go back to six and four, six on four four days off, six six on six days on four days off. But let's talk about it first. So he's he sort of putting it up to the uh, guardian, the representative bodies, but 
there, there hasn't been one guard that I've spoken to of different ranks who is in favour of this. They just see it as a really, really no, bad move. There, uh, yeah, I mean, we've been talking about this before. I mean, we can go back to the GRA uh, earlier this year where, I mean, there was just uproar over it and um, the commissioner and the rank and file guardie were not meeting eye to eye on this. There had been meetings upon meetings upon meetings um, and they were getting nowhere. But, I mean, at least from the rank and file, from the GRA perspective, they were willing to continue talking, but the, the commissioner was done talking. Uh, so we are where we are now with this. It just can, it's turning into a crisis for guards because for the last couple of years they they've enjoyed a good system, I think, and now it's being rip, ripped from under them. But he has said, "Let's go and talk about this." I, I think it's WRC. So he said, yeah. "Let," but he said, "This is my position. Let's negotiate." So maybe it is an effort to get movement from the representative bodies. I don't know, but look, you know, even here's a classic example, right? A friend of mine, he was doing. The four day, four day on, four day off. Now he lived, I think about, I'm going to make it up, but about 70, 70, 80 kilometers from his station, right? So that, can you imagine effectively if it's six days or you're doing five days in, in a row, your, your commuting bills, petrol, and whatever, go up by 25% straight away. And then you have your childcare, you know, and things like that. And, you know, there was a level of stability. You knew what you're going to be doing. So every guard of every rank I've spoken to, thinks this is a retrograde step. But we'll see what happens with the negotiations. But the deadline is, I think it's the 6th of November, the, the commissioner has said, it's going to, the, the new, old, new roster is going to replace the COVID roster. So we'll be in for an interesting few months to see what happens. We will. We'll have to see where that, I mean, they can't strike, can they? So, I mean, <laughs> what kind of action can they take if they're not? Well, they can. I mean, you know, there was the blue flu. And you remember a couple of years ago, there was, they can effectively strike and it was going to happen. Um, and, you know, it was it went very, very close to the wire. So um, I, I think you and I can agree on this, Paul. Gardy that we've spoken to of all ranks are very militant about this and they're very, very angry about this. And they also say something that has to be acknowledged, that there were over, we broke the story, you'll remember, that there were over 100 resignations in 2022. It'll be interesting to see, as opposed to retirements, which are mandatory at a certain certain age. So more Gardaí than ever before, and it has been increasing every year, are quitting. And I think people, I don't know if people said this to you, but people said this to me, if this happens, I'm out of here. So I, I, I just wonder if the commissioner is aware of the popular anger within the guards about this. It'd be interesting to see. I mean, it's already a, a, a force in crisis in terms of numbers. Yeah. So we'll have to see. We better move on because I'm conscious of time. But uh, you want... Can I talk about the RTAs? Go ahead. It's been a terrible week for road traffic accidents in Ireland and of Irish people. So uh, there have been seven in Ireland. So this we're recording this on Thursday um, and there have been seven in the previous just less than a week. But there were also a terrible case of a father and son from Port I mentioned it earlier, who were on holiday in Al Anya in Turkey and they were on the last day of their holiday. They were, it was happened on Monday. Uh, the young child who was 10 was Dylan Fitzpatrick and his father was Owen Fitzpatrick and they were killed when their moped was struck by a bus. So the nine Irish people have been killed in the Irish roads. Please God, there won't be any more tonight, but there have been a couple of really bad cases. And I always, I always find road traffic accidents are one of the hardest things to cover. And I'll tell you why. So in journalism, you have the five W's, who, what, when, where, why. So with road crashes, we find out who, where, when, where, where it happened, who it was, what age, when it happened. But the why is almost impossible to explain. And people want answers. So, for example, why was this man shot dead in central Dublin? You and I can explain to people, this is why Gardy believe he was shot dead. See, road crashes, it is just horrendous. Literally, that old cliche about being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Oh. Yeah, and it's, and it's complete random and sometimes there are no answers. Owen and Dylan Fitzpatrick were just beside, uh, were on, a, on a, a moped on the last day of their holiday and they're killed. And uh, you were talking about doorsteps. I went down to Port Leisha to, and I spoke to, the, the mother is, is Claire Darling and she flew out to Turkey on the Tuesday. But I, I approached her grandparents, her parents, Dylan's grandparents and they were very gracious lovely really really lovely people in the, and I'm always struck by how decent people are when we knock on their doors you know vast majority of, they're really really decent people they give me they they rang me back and gave me Claire's number so I spoke to Claire when she was heading over to Turkey and it was one of the hardest things I've ever had to do she was listening and 
she was so nice and she was talking about her dead child and she was no longer with Owen, the father, but she was said that there are no issues. They were totally united. They have two children, Owen, uh, Dylan and Cain, who's, who's 14. Just they were united in love for their kids. I was listening to her and you have to do your job as a journalist and you have to talk to them and you let them. And it was really strong and really, I thought it was a really good interview that her comments were really strong. They appeared in the Mirror and the Star on Wednesday. But it was just so sad and saddening listening to her. So there's part of you is writing it down and going, yes, and you're talking to her. But the other party wants to cry because she was talking about her child in the present tense. He loves life. He's a great swimmer. He doesn't do all this. I find that really, really hard. And I often find RTA is really, really hard to cover. And I, I just want to think of all those, the, the nine Irish people so far have lost their lives this week. It's just it's horrendous. Sad. Really, really sad. And it, could, it could happen to anyone, but it to happen to your child. Yeah, I can't imagine it. Um, heartbreaking. And, and um, I mean, fair play to that mother for, I suppose, in that in that hor- horrible, horrific moment, um, moments that she's going through right now that she she was she had found the courage and to be able to speak about it and to you and to to want to share uh, those memories of of her son um you know we often get uh flack sometimes for contacting people in these moments of tragedy but to some people it's cathartic and they want to share uh the memories of their loved ones and speak about them and, and obviously clearly that mother did want to speak about her her son um you know to you uh, and and so you know that that's why we do it uh, because these people are human beings in the end of the day they deserve to be remembered they're more than a statistic and and she spoke and people commented on what she not not about my interview but on what she said because you know say for example Port Leisha GEA club uh Owen was a member and Keen the older brother was a member Dylan, they said it Miss Darling said he wasn't really interested that's grand but they even they remarked not in my interview, but on what she said, she spoke, they commented on their co- statement about the deaths, about what she said in her interview. And that is that is necessary what we do because we give people a voice. I think it's hard and it takes a toll on us. I think it does take a toll on us, but her story and what she wanted to say about her beloved child and the child's father, her ex-partner, is really, really important. It is hugely important. And so... Just something else, we are the, the week in crime. So I do want to mark the fact that uh, a woman, there, a, a man has been charged in relation to the alleged murder of a lady called Deepa Dinamani, who was an Indian national. A national. Her husband appeared in court in Cork and he is charged with her murder uh, on the 14th of July. Now, he's been remanded in custody. Listeners will know that uh, when he appeared in at the district court at, for murder, the district court doesn't have power to give you bail. So uh, if the husband wants to, to get bail, it's a matter for the High Court. But just to note that uh, he has been charged with uh, his wife's murder. And we'll follow that closely. There were other topics we wanted to touch, but I, I think we've spoken about a lot already. Um, can I just can I just very quickly mention one, Paul? It's, yeah. I, as you know, crime reporters mostly do defence as well. And I did a, a really important story this week. I, I got uh, Brendan Harlan. TD uh, in Wexford put a parliamentary question in about Defence Forces strengths. Now what was really interesting about that was Michal Martin in the parliamentary answer told him that since 2016 more than 5,500 men and women have left the Defence Forces in seven years and that is shocking so that now means that as of the end of May this year that the Army, the Navy and the Air Corps all in has numbers a strength of 7,764. Now I looked, in 1960 it was just over 8,000. So I think we can say with some certainty we are now at the lowest strength of the Defence Forces in more than 60 years and that's a bit of a crisis. People are just walking. I mean in 2000, they are. In in 2006, not even 10 years ago, there were over 10, it was about 10,400 in all the defence forces. Now it's 7,764. That people are very worried about this now, and it is. I, I mean, Deputy Ireland said it was truly staggering, and he's if it continues, he'll worry about the defence forces' ability to do its constitutional job, which is to defend Ireland and to provide a aid to the civil power and stuff. So it is, it is extremely worrying. Now, to be fair. Katanisja, in a statement to us, acknowledged this and he said his job is to stabilise that firstly and then increase the numbers. 
and he said that there are various things that pay has been increased and that sort of stuff but that's Really, really low numbers. Extraordinarily low, but the pay is not good in the in the defence forces, is it? No, and you know, I mean, the the the, 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 the talent, she said it has been increasing. It has, and things like you know, the, the army ranger wing were given an, a pay raise a wee while ago, and that sort of stuff. But look, if you and guards would always tell you this. Say, if you think of the Joe Biden visit, there were guardy working beside soldiers, right? The guardy. As is their right and it's the proper thing, we're getting overtime, we're getting allowances, we're getting various things. The soldiers were on 24-hour tours and they were just getting normal pay for doing a 24-hour shift and they had to sleep in, in field and, you know, you know, that sort of stuff. So we don't value the defence forces enough. I think Ireland in, in general, people are quite blind to the work the defence forces do. I, you'll know that I was in uh, Lebanon there with Mick O'Neill, the photographer, on the 19th of June for a week, seeing what the... It's under 22nd Infantry Battalion. It's their sixth one tour of duty. They are a massive asset to the state. We're very, very lucky to have them. But there is an exodus and it needs to be addressed. Totally. Um, we want to talk in detail about the Carlo Post Office story. I think it's one that has captivated the country in a way because of its unique nature. There, There's a reason why we can't speak about it in detail at the moment. That is because there is a sentencing hearing tomorrow, Friday. Um, so we're going to do a pod on that because uh, there's plenty to talk about there and there might even be people to talk to. We'll see about it. Um, so, yes, yeah, stay tuned for that. And again, just to stress, any issues you guys want us to cover, more than happy to have we look. So we're, we're back. We're, we're refreshed and ready to go and we can't wait to do more. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>